thank you very much. Um, I have. Um, it's really wonderful to be here in Toronto again. Um, it seems that I've managed to come to Toronto at least once every two years, either here or to York. Uh, so this time it is especially an honor to have been invited to participate in Israeli Apartheid Week. And first let me also acknowledge um, the history of the land on which we are convening. Um, uh, and emphasize the point that we are gathering on colonized land. And I think that this recognition reminds us that as we deliberate on the importance of solidarity with the Palestinian people who have been subjected to the violence of settler colonialism, we also acknowledge the fact that um, here in the Americas, here on Turtle Island especially, there is a related history of settler colonialism. And therefore we honor those whose land was stolen, who were those who were subjected to an unthinkable genocide and who were subsequently subjected to a genocidal erasure, to an epistemic epistemic violence that is responsible for uh, the fact that many people believe that it is all right to ignore the continued struggles of indigenous people for sovereign control over their land and their languages and their cultures. Uh, some of the few really bizarre exceptions uh, to this erasure can be found in sports teams that, that continue to refuse to change their derogatory names. Uh, and of course, in, 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 in the US, in 2020, there are still sports teams that call themselves the Kansas City Chiefs, or the Atlanta Braves, or the Cleveland Indians. And I could go on and on. This process of ideologically belittling indigenous people, of course, leads to historical amnesia. And there is no place on Turtle Island, there is no place in all of the Americas that is without a history preceding the invasion by Europeans. The colonizers were conquerors whose purpose was to settle on the land they found, but the presence of people was an obstacle. And therefore they set about destroying them or converting them. This colonization process constitutes the foundational racism of our history. And of course, in the US, slavery cannot be accurately understood except in relation to settler colonialism. The histories of the US and Canada are settler colonial histories. So. But if we look at Israel, uh, we do discover a difference uh, because the state of Israel is the only settler colonial nation that continues to try to expand. And more recent developments such as, and you've heard about this, the plans to further annex the Jewish settlements in uh, the West Bank remind us that possibilities of self-determination and sovereignty in Palestine have been severely curtailed. The important act activism and advocacy of um, students against Israeli apartheid, students for justice in Palestine, BDS activists, and others throughout 
of this region are helping to transform the landscape of the campaign for solidarity with Palestine. And in the process is strengthening our struggles against racism and our overall quest for social justice. These organizations, these and other organizations and activists are a part of a strong global community of people who understand that their stance against the occupation of Palestine is linked to progressive movements against racism, misogyny, xenophobia, assaults on the environment, and all efforts to make this planet a better place for us all. I am very happy that my participation in Israeli Apartheid Week here at the University of Toronto coincides with International Women's Day because it gives us the opportunity to very specifically reflect on the role of Palestinian women in the ongoing resistance to Israeli Apartheid. And in this context, I would like to evoke Leila Khaled and Razmia O'Day. Yes. <laughs> With both of whom I've had the opportunity to speak at uh, events designed to uh, further generate solidarity with Palestine. On the occasion of International Women's Day, uh, where uh, when people are, are gathering uh, and are marching and are protesting and resisting all over the world, I want us to take note of the fact that there are currently 43 Palestinian women in Israeli prisons. Um, according to Adamir, which is the prisoner support and um, human rights organization in Palestine. Uh, since the beginning of the occupation, over 10,000 Palestinian women have been arrested. And I want to read a, a short uh, passage from Adamir's statement on the occasion of International Women's Day. In the past year, and just like previous years, Palestinian women and girls are routinely arrested from the streets, is from Israeli military checkpoints, and during violent night raids on their homes. Those military incursions are accompanied by the presence of Israeli soldiers, intelligence officers, and police dogs, during which destruction of household items and property damage takes place. They are blindfolded and handcuffed, and they are forcibly taken to military jeeps. Women also continue to suffer torture and ill treatment in interrogation centers, in addition to difficult and deteriorating detention conditions at um, Damon Prison, which was once a stable for horses and a storage for tobacco. Um, if you visit the Adamir um, website, you will uh, discover descriptions of uh, quite a number of women uh, who, have, who are political prisoners, uh, including students, at, for example, at uh, Birzeit University. Uh, I'll, I'll mention uh, one young woman whose name is Maiz Abu Gush, Gush, and she's 23 years old. She's a fourth year university student, uh, and her house was raided by um, Israeli occupation forces. Uh, they were escorted by uh, security dogs. Abu Gush was then transferred to Al Maskovia. Uh, Al Maskovia Interrogation Center, where she was subject to severe physical and psychological torture and ill treatment for uh, at least a month. She was then transferred to Damon Prison, 
um, and, and provide it with a list of charges. And what's important is that the charges included participating in university activities and coordinating a summer camp. And she is still awaiting her trial. And as I indicated, if you, if you um, go to the website of Idemir, uh, there is um, uh, an enormous amount of information uh, about prisoners, uh, Palestinian prisoners in general, but specifically uh, descriptions uh, of Palestinian women who are behind bars. Of course, the theme of Israeli Apartheid Week this year is Unite Against Racism. Um, this is an important mandate because we are increasingly recognizing that the struggle against racism is global. And this acknowledgement um, makes us recognize it's that uh, racism is far more complicated than was previously assumed, particularly during um, the era when the only consistent purveyors of, of official racism were understood to be the United States and Canada. <laughs> <laughs> What was the other? Um, <laughs> South Africa, of course. Uh, and, um, um, well, yeah, we know about the histories of racism in Canada, but um, unfortunately Canada was not globally recognized as a purveyor of racism. Um, maybe it is. <laughs> But the point that I want to make is precisely because of the work that we have done here in Canada and in, in, in the United States over the last period to develop solidarity with the Palestinian people, we have expanded and deepened our understanding of the global dimensions of racism and how it is necessary to redefine the anti-indigenous, the anti-black, the anti-Latinx, and other racisms uh, that we challenged in this part of the world. Of course, we are aware that Israel trains police departments all over the world. And uh, of course, uh, some years ago during the um, Ferguson protests, it was recognized that this very tiny police department in Ferguson, um, whose name no one knew, uh, it's a small um, municipality outside of St. Louis, but the Ferguson police had been trained by the Israeli army. Um, and of course, uh, Israel is in part responsible for the increased militarization of police uh, throughout this area and throughout uh, the world. Under the mandate of the indivisibility of justice, which is a concept utilized by Dr. Martin Luther King during his lifetime, we have succeeded in bringing the question of ending the occupation and the strategy of boycott, divestment, and sanction onto the agendas of many social justice movements across, um, across the world, around the world. And, um, and I should point out that this is especially true of um, anti-racist social justice movements. As someone who has been involved in activist efforts to generate solidarity with Palestine for at least 50 years, uh, actually longer, <laughs> uh, because um, 
I was an undergraduate student between the years uh, 1961 and 1965 uh, at um, a Jewish university, Brandeis University. And it was there that I became uh, familiar uh, with the Palestinian struggles. Um, I always point out that uh, it was my Jewish classmates who introduced me um, when I was quite young to the struggle for solidarity with Palestine. Having been involved for all of these years, more than 50, you can um, you know, do the math. <laughs> I told you when I was a student. <laughs> I can remember periods during which this work, as difficult as it may be today, was uh, uh, far more difficult. Uh, uh, I can um, remember when people were uh, literally afraid, and of course this is still the case in some places, uh, to stand in solidarity uh, with, with Palestinians. Uh, um, and you know, even today, we take into consideration the vast influence of um, the Israel lobby, the Zionist lobby, and, and the Israel's allies, especially um, um, the government that uh, uh, is... Um, um, well, <laughs> the government that is currently occupied by someone who shall not be named <laughs> during this gathering. <laughs> but not only the U.S., and Brazil, and India, and other countries whose uh, political leadership has uh, become what you might call proto-fascist. And it is important to point out that while we vigorously resist efforts to turn the political clock back to a more regressive period, we forcefully push forward despite these obstacles. We don't have to assume that our work comes to a standstill because of the backwardness and intransigence of the current political leadership in the US and elsewhere. It is true that the election three and a half years ago alerted right-wing populists all over the planet, uh, including in Israel, and the passage of the law barring proponents of BDS from traveling to Israel was clearly uh, related to the retrograde position of uh, the person who shall remain unnamed. Uh, uh, his retrograde position in support of Israel and his specific efforts to institute travel bans. Uh, and of course, attacks against BDS activists, attacks against uh, Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Voice for Peace and other proponents of justice in Palestine have clearly multiplied. But as I uh, said before, we cannot allow the rising repression to prevent us from apprehending the rising resistance. Uh, I want to talk for a moment about um, the, the U recent UN report entitled Israeli Practices Toward uh, the Palestinian People and the Question of Apartheid, which was published in 2017 and written, of course, by Richard Falk and uh, Virginia Tilly for the Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. This was at the request of 18 Arab countries. Uh, the fact that the report was quickly singled out 
was immediately denounced by the Secretary General of the United Nations and removed from the website of the Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia is an indication of the reverberations of this ultra-conservatism. Um, the reverberations of this ultra-conservatism within the United Nations. The term apartheid has been used in connection with Israeli practices in occupied Palestine for a very long time. And I would like to thank you, University of Toronto students and, and those here who have insisted on making the connections between the historical systems of apartheid and the current situation in the occupied territories. And I understand that Israeli Apartheid Week um, was created here on this campus. Yeah. In 2005, am I correct? Ago, yeah. So that means uh, 16, 16 years ago. But now, all over the country, and especially on campuses of colleges and universities, uh, Israeli Apartheid uh, Week is observed. And I understand that um, um, the markers of Israeli Apartheid Week are International Women's Day on March 8th, and um, the um, an International um, Day of um, Eliminating uh, Racism and Discrimination that is on March 21st, which uh, of course uh, uh, marks the um, Charleville Uprising in South Africa. Um, so thank you, thank you University of Toronto. Not the administration, but... <laughs> much success in the campaign to compel the University of Toronto to divest. So back to the report that was co-authored by uh, Richard Falk and Virginia Tilly. Um, it should be perhaps pointed out that, um, that they don't use the concept of apartheid um, uh, for purposes of castigation or revilement. The term apartheid is used in that report as a legal concept that has standing in international law and in the various conventions and instruments of the United Nations. The Apartheid Convention of the United uh, Nations, uh, and I'm quoting from the report, sets forth that the crime of apartheid consists of discrete inhuman acts, but that such acts acquire the status of crimes against humanity if they intentionally serve the core purpose of racial domination. And the report further points out that the Rome Statute uh, of the International Crim Criminal Court specifies and its definition that the presence of a, quote, institutionalized regime serving the, quote, intention of racial domination constitutes apartheid. And I think the analysis uh, um, presented by the report should be taken seriously. Um, and the, re the report is still available online. It was removed from the, um, the United Nations page, but you can find it elsewhere. Um, and they, I, I'm, I'm quoting again from the report. This report finds that the strategic fragmentation of the Palestinian people is the principal method by which Israel imposes an apartheid regime. It first examines how the history of war, partition, de jure, and de facto annexation and prolonged occupation in Palestine has led to the Palestinian people being divided into different geographic regions administered by distinct sets of laws. 
And there's, there's of course, A, B, and C, uh, if you know about this uh, geographical uh, division. This fragmentation operates to stabilize the Israeli regime of racial domination over the Palestinians and attempts to weaken the will and capacity of Palestinian people to mount a unified and effective resistance. Different methods are employed based on where Palestinians live. This is the core means by which Israel enforces apartheid and at the same time impedes international recognition of how the system works as a complementary whole to comprise an apartheid regime. And so I would encourage you uh, to uh, uh, read the report and take seriously the analysis uh, that is presented uh, uh, by uh, uh, Richard Falk and Virginia Tilden. But the question I want to pose now is, is this. Why do we think it is so important to engage in public critiques of the state of Israel? for the very same reasons that we think it is important to criticize the government and state in Canada, the government and state in the United States. People who demonstrate against the US in Africa, the Middle East, in Asia, in Latin America, in Australia have every right to engage in public criticism this is, I, I thought this was how we attempted to encourage democratic communities. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> For centuries, black people inside the U.S. have, have uh, been encouraged by, have benefited from, and have relied on public criticism that emanated beyond the borders of the U.S. Two years ago, I was in Northern Ireland. And as a matter of fact, it was on International Women's Day, exactly two years ago. And I was really surprised to hear um, that um, Frederick Douglass, uh, who made a trip to Belfast in 1845, was still being evoked. Um, there, there were images, murals, and, 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 and people were talking about his visit to Belfast, to Dublin, to Cork, to Limerick. Uh, um, and, and of course, Irish solidarity in the struggle against slavery represented the willingness of people there to stand up against the institution of slavery. And I could give you many other examples of, of, um, of criticism of the US government. Uh, I could talk about my own case. Uh, when I was um, facing the death penalty on three different charges, uh, and uh, it was only because people all over the world were willing to stand up and say no to the U.S. government uh, that, that I was eventually released. And of course, more recently, we have witnessed this outpouring of uh, public criticism and solidarity in connection with the Black Lives Matter movement. The names of black youth killed by racist police have reverberated all over the world. So if it's OK to criticize the government of the United States of America, if it's OK to criticize the government of Canada, why is it not OK to criticize the state of Israel, the government. Now, what I want to say is that I remember um, in my own political education, 
A primary aspect of that education consisted in being able to distinguish between institutions and individuals and governments and people. Uh, uh, in other words, even when de jure racism was the legal arena for the South, I can remember that my mother taught me not to assume that every person, simply because they were white, was racist. And of course today we more clearly recognize uh, the extent to which um, um, structures that produce ideologies, that reproduce ideologies uh, of, of, of racism uh, are uh, far, more under, far more important to a clear understanding of racism than uh, manifestations in um, individual ideas and, 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 and attitudes. And we recognize that, that, um, that individuals often do the work of the state by um, unconsciously uh, internalizing uh, those ideologies and then mistaking them for their own individual thoughts or their own individual emotions. Uh, uh. So the point that I'm making is that when is that we do not conflate the state of Israel, its ethnic cleansing policies, its strategies of demographic engineering with, with all of the people who live in Israel, and certainly not with all Jews. Um, and I make this point because we should not fear the strategies of hurling accusations of anti-Semitism at anyone who disagrees with uh, the um, policies of the state of Israel. Rather, we should point out the affinity of racism and anti-Semitism and that in standing up against the racism of the state of Israel, we passionately say no to anti-Semitism as well. <laughs> you, you heard during the um, introduction that uh, last year, I was scheduled to receive this uh, major human rights award uh, um, in the city where I grew up, Birmingham, Alabama, from the Birmingham Civil Rights uh, uh, Institute. Uh, and, and before I managed to go to Birmingham to participate in the big gala that they had organized uh, around the the award, I received a call, and I was told that uh, that the award would be retracted. And I said, oh yes? <laughs> <laughs> so why is that? <laughs> um, the people who called me were afraid to um, reveal that it was because of my of activism and advocacy uh, uh, around uh, Palestinian justice, and they simply told me that it was um, because of my public statements, and my public statements were a matter of record. Um, so I was actually kind of confused for a while. Um, um, well, I don't know, some of you may have um, followed that story. Um, um, so I did not get the award, not yet. Uh, I'll tell you. Uh, or, but last year, um, people in the community, including the mayor of, of Birmingham, who was a young black man, um, uh, protested the decision of the Civil Rights Institute. And they indicated that they wanted to organize a gathering themselves. Uh, and so, uh, last year, um, this time last year, there was a gathering that was far larger than anything the um, Birmingham Civil Rights uh, Institute would have organized. Uh, 
and it included vast numbers of black people, um, um, but also um, white people in Birmingham and also Jewish people who came. As a matter of fact, there was a Shabbat the night before I spoke that, that emphasized uh, the importance of, um, of, of recognizing that justice is in, indivisible. And so finally they did contact me again. Um, and, uh, and they indicated that they wanted to offer me the Civil Rights uh, Prize again, uh, the Human Rights Award. Um, and I said, well, what has changed? <laughs> uh, and they indicated that they had uh, gotten rid of a bunch of the board of members of the board of directors. <laughs> So this was an indication where their project completely backfired uh, uh, because it provided an occasion for people you know, all over the country and other parts of the world who were aware of this to think seriously about uh, this notion that everybody in the world deserves justice except the Palestinian people. And, and so, um, um, as a matter of fact, I, I received m many statements from um, from Jewish organizations, uh, and um, a large group of Jewish rabbis wrote a statement protesting uh, the the action. Uh, so um, that's a good thing, and uh, it, it it made many of us realize that. There has been, there's actually been progress over the last period uh, because one could not have imagined that kind of outpouring of, 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 of support, uh, um, say, um, 15, 10, 15 years ago. Um, sorry, I just lost my um, timer. There we go. So I want to talk a little bit about international solidarity and how important it is and how every pivotal movement in our recent history has had a clear relationship to global events. The Vietnam War in the 60s and 70s, the anti-apartheid movement in the 80s and 90s, the effort to stave off the Islamophobia and the anti-Arab racism of the, the aughts, and the tens, is that the way you say it? The aughts and the tens? Uh, and of course, leading up to the present. And so thinking about that period, uh, it seems to me is that this is precisely the era. This is supposed to be the era of the dismantling of the Israeli occupation of Palestine. Now, now why do I say this? I say this because uh, uh, there was um, an important momentum that took place in the 60s, the late 60s, the, the early 70s that led in 1975 to the passage of the United Nations Resolution 3379. And of course, this was the resolution uh, that recognized Zionism as a form of racism and racial discrimination. This was supposed to be, this was supposed to be a the beginning of, or at least uh, an, a, 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 an important conjuncture in the trajectory toward Palestinian freedom. And for those of us struggling against racism in this part of the world, and against apartheid in South Africa, 
This was a pivotal moment. It allowed us to recognize the interrelationality of these contexts and these struggles. It meant that all three struggles were intertwined. Uh, the struggle against racism in the US, the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, and the struggle against the occupation of Palestine. It wasn't until 1991 that the UN revoked this resolution. And if we had time, we'd talk about uh, uh, you know, the historical transformations uh, 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 and, and the, the sort of you know, retrograde conditions that were responsible for the revocation of uh, the resolution. But if they thought that this would destroy the movement for justice in Palestine, they were wrong. And as a matter of fact, Palestinians have taught us about the longevity of struggle. A year before last marked the 70th anniversary of the Nakba. This struggle has already spanned three or four generations and people have not given up. And I, I, I see parallels between the struggle against anti-black racism and the um, Palestinian struggle for sovereignty and justice and, and freedom. Uh, and particularly the ways in which the um, that those struggles and, and, and that impulse toward freedom has been passed down from one generation to the next. And of course, if one thinks about black struggles, we have to go back uh, 500 years or so. Uh, and it's kind of, um, it's kind of amazing that, that people have not given up. And what's a, 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 another parallel I see uh, between the struggles is the ways in which Palestinian people and, and black people in this part of the world have managed not only to continue to fight back, but they have um, created beauty in the process uh, uh, and, and held on. held on to democratic ideas. And as a matter of fact, if one wants to um, point to the force in this part of the world that is responsible for the, um, in, um, the enlargement of democracy, or um, that which has been responsible for continually challenge challenging the government of the United States, it's black struggle. And it's, it's so bizarre that people often refer to uh, black liberation struggles as um, special interests, <laughs> right? Or as identity politics. That, 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 that don't really matter after all. Uh, uh, but it seems to me that uh, uh, the, the, the very heart of the struggle for democracy, and uh, I say the struggle for democracy uh, because we clearly have not uh, achieved democracy in any sense. Uh, In 2014, when the Ferguson protests occurred, and when Black Lives Matter was crafted into a network and, uh, and then an, an, an overall movement, it was with the assistance of Palestinian solidarity. And, and as a matter of fact, 
One can argue that because Palestinians who were involved in on the ground resistance in Palestine, when Palestinians offered solidarity to uh, Ferguson protesters, uh, it was not only important in the sense that it gave the per Ferguson protesters um, uh, encouragement, uh, but that it served as the first step in creating global solidarity with the Ferguson protest. And one might argue that we, we would not be where we are today in terms of uh, finally, finally being able to challenge racism. Um, I mean, there was a time, when, I mean, I remember not that long ago uh, when I would talk about racism, people would look at me like I was a dinosaur. Uh, Right? Uh, didn't you know that uh, that we that we have a black president, and <laughs> and that's obviously the last uh, barrier uh, produced by racism. Was, so don't you know this is a post-racial era? Uh, <laughs> and now, of course, we are at least able to publicly speak about racism and white supremacy. Um, and, you know, what I'm saying is that, that, that all of this, uh, um, all of these developments are very much related to that uh, move of, uh, of, um, by Palestinians offering solidarity uh, to the Ferguson protesters. But at the same time, many people aren't aware of the fact that, um, that um, the Ferguson protested the Ferguson protesters weren't all black. Uh, there were Palestinian American protesters who were on the line in Ferguson, as there were Latinx uh, protesters. Uh, you know, oftentimes we think too simplistically. We assume that just because the struggle is called a black struggle or a struggle for black liberation, that all of the actors involved in that struggle are black. But that has never been the case. As a matter of fact, the, the first slave uprisings, the first uprisings by enslaved Africans in this part of the world were assisted by indigenous people. And therefore, they are as much a part of that struggle as anyone who was African. And so, as a consequence of, 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 of this forging of, um, of uh, global solidarity with the Ferguson protesters, people involved in the, the movement against state violence learn fundamental lessons about racism and about uh, the police. We learn that we could not simply point to individual perpetrators of racist police violence and demand simply that they be made individually accountable. Um, and, you know, black people in the U.S. can also be U.S. centric. Uh, and, and we learned about the ideological work that happens on on all of us, uh, uh, we discovered, we discovered as a result of that offer of solidarity from Palestinians uh, that um, that the Israeli army gets its tear gas from the U.S. And we learned that police forces get their training in anti-terrorism from the Israeli army. And therefore, racism um, acquires aspects of the so-called anti-terrorist strategies. Uh, um, this is why the important demand for demilitarization de of the police began to replace the simple call for the prosecution 
for the arrest and prosecution of the individual, a police officer. Uh, you know, because we can, we can prosecute individuals all we want, and the structure will remain intact. And people who don't understand that um, often argue, well, that wasn't an act of racist police violence, because the policeman or woman is black. Um, well, of course, around the same time as Ferguson happened, we saw Asata Shakur name one of the ten most dangerous terrorists in the world. And she still remains on the FBI's list of the most dangerous terrorists in the world. And there is a two million dollar reward on her head to this day. The point that I'm making is that we've learned how to develop more complicated, more intersectional approaches in our struggle against racism. Which brings us to the question of how Palestine solidarity helps to nourish and further feminist approaches to social justice. Uh, uh, and what uh, we have begun to call um, abolition feminism. You know, certainly we can talk about Palestinian women's contribution to the struggle. And you know, I've already um, evoked Leila Khaled. We could talk about Razmia O'Day's struggle and the sexual abuse she in endured and the fact that um, she was deported from the US, which was her adopted home. We can talk about the important work of women's organizations such as the General Union of Palestinian Women, which is a part of the, um, uh, the coalition of, um, of uh, Palestinian uh, civil society um, organizations that called for boycott, divestment, and sanction. We can talk about feminist academics at uh, Birzet University, and perhaps about the fact that one of our foremost uh, feminist philosophers, Judith Butler, is also one of the most outspoken supporters of the Palestinian struggle. But I want to focus on the way that the Palestinian struggle has provided practical lessons regarding the interconnections of race and gender and sexuality and ability. Yeah. Um, I mean, for example, the analyses of pinkwashing, uh, uh, which have been so helpful uh, to us. Uh, Israel likes to represent itself as the paragon of democracy in the region. And its evidence is that it is a haven, or it likes to think of itself as a haven for LGBTQ communities. Uh, but Israel does not say that it is welcoming to queer Palestinians who call for justice for their people, even as they recognize how important it is to challenge homophobia and transphobia within the struggle. And likewise, it is counterproductive to assume that it is, that one should oppose transphobia, for example, only when it has become trendy to do so. Um, when one gets to talk about bathroom use, for example, uh, uh, and pronouns. And I'm not belittling that because I think that's very important. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we should focus on the, um, the incredible violence that is uh, uh, inflicted on trans people, especially trans women, and especially trans women of color, black, black trans women and women of color. And, and of course, um, the trans movement has had a powerful impact on our struggles for prison abolition. Uh, if we, uh, if we've reached the conclusion that no qualitative change will ever result from the reform of prisons, uh, as a matter of fact, the entire history of the institution of the prison has been a history of reform. 
Yes. <laughs> and reform has only created a more repressive, more powerful, more permanent systems of imprisonment. Uh, so, long ago, theorists and activists reached the conclusion that um, prison, prison should be abolished. I mean, that um, discussion about the abolition of prisons goes all the way back to the invention of prisons, as, as um, uh, um, a mode of punishment, imprisonment as, as, the, as a mode of punishment. Uh, you know, back in the late 1700s, there were debates uh, uh, about uh, whether uh, prisons were um, undemocratic. Uh, they're actually quite democratic, uh, quote unquote, uh, uh, because um, imprisonment consists precisely in the um, divestment of democratic rights. And as a matter of fact, prison as punishment could only have emerged in a quote, uh, when I say democratic, I should say in a capitalist democracy, a bourgeois democracy, which we need to say. Uh, and of course, recently we've come to recognize that prisons are gender institutions and that in the first place, its gender structure is a binary structure which reflects the ideology of gender in the larger society. Uh, and therefore, the abolition of the prison would also have to entail the abolition of gender policing. Um, which leads me to further reflect on what we in the abolitionist movement have learned from the Palestinian struggle. If I were to venture a general critique of the prison reform movement, which spans the decades from the early, early 1800s, the late 1700s, early 1800s to the present, I would say that many reformers, as important and as passionate as they have been about eliminating cruel and inhumane punishment. They fail to recognize that punishment can only be transformed if the social context, if the larger society is radically transformed. When one looks at Palestine, this is self-evident. It is impossible to address the problem of imprisonment without looking at the larger society. And of course, we use the term mass incarceration, uh, uh, which can sometimes be misleading, because there are those particularly uh, you know, uh, in the current government uh, and, and right-wing circles who say that they're opposed to mass incarceration. Uh, what they want to do is get as many people as possible outside of the prisons using electronic bracelets and so forth and so on, so that it doesn't cost so much. Uh, uh, when one looks at Palestine, one sees that it's impossible to address the problem of imprisonment without uh, looking at the occupation without looking at the uh, larger society. And currently there are over 5,000 Palestinian prisoners. Uh, but over the years, virtually every family in Palestine has been affected by political imprisonment. Uh, and I, uh, during my visit approximately 10 years ago, I, I was struck by the fact that almost everybody I met had either been in prison or had relatives in prison. Since the occupation began more in, in 1976, more than 800,000 Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza have been in prison. 40% of Palestinian men in the West Bank have gone to jail at one time or another. So, you know, we have a habit of calling the U.S. a prison nation, and there's, you know, so many books with that title. But um, 
Palestine under Israeli occupation is certainly the worst possible example of a carceral society, or maybe I should say the best example of a carceral society. So here, here in this part of the world, we have learned not to trust reform strategies that call for ankle bracelets. You know, someone the other day told me we should not use that term, ankle bracelets, uh, uh, because they're shackles. House arrest, for example, and the extension of other carceral strategies into the larger society. Uh, and of course, wherever we went, uh, people said, you know, Palestine is the largest open air prison in the world. So insights that have emanated from the struggle against the Israeli occupation of Palestine have helped us to understand that prison abolition, which targets the most dramatic example of structural racism in the US, is an essential aspect of the struggle against racism. But also, as Marian Kava has emphasized, prison is not feminist. At least, um, not feminist uh, when you uh, think about anti-racist, anti-capitalist feminists. Um, because there is also carceral feminism. And we recognize that carceral feminism does not represent the best interests of black people, of Muslims, of people of color, etc. So we are united against racism in the US. We are uniting against racism in Canada. We are uniting against racism in Palestine and Israel. And let me conclude uh, by emphasizing once more that justice uh, is indeed indivisible and the struggle for freedom continues. Aluta continua. Thank you.